Yes, please, yeah. joining us. I'm so sorry, but do you mind if I sort of um, get you to move the conversation outside? Thank you so much. This is maybe the remote moderation. I don't have a clicker, so I will sit and just um, yeah, do use the presentation. Yeah. Oh, thank and you so much. So I will call on you okay. and um, uh, get you to the intervention. Okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we have run out of space. Yeah. So Josephine Melizzi, right? Yes, Melizzi. Melizzi. Okay. Great. connected to something else? Is someone scrolling this down? Or like this is me. Don't worry about it. Okay. Ignore it. Okay, it's okay. fine. Cool. Okay. <laughs> Don't panic. I'm, I'm not that type. <laughs> I'm going to start. Hello. Good morning. Hi. <laughs> so we had a... Um, we're going to aim to start in about five minutes, I think. So... Thank you very much for your patience. There was clearly a celebration happening here earlier. We ordered the star balloons, especially for you.
busco, te busco. Si no te escribo, estás con el teléfono ahí. Escríbeme. Okay, la, I think we can start, no? Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the session on the Best Practice Forum on Gender and Access. Um, this is our second year for the Best Practice Forum, focusing on access. And this session is actually going to be a working session. So don't get attached to your seats or to your laptop. We're going to make you move around a little bit. Um, and the reason for this is actually will be clear in a little while. Why am I being mysterious? Because it's fun and it's 10 o'clock in the morning. Um, so hello, my name is Jack. Uh, I'm with the Association for Progressive Communications. We are an organization that works on ICT for social justice. I hit the Women's Rights Program. I'm also a MAG member and um, facilitator of this um, Best Practice Forum and ha have the support of many wonderful people who've been committing to this work for the past three years. Um, including Anri, including Renata, who's not here, Cheryl Miller, as well as all of the different focal points, who, some of whom are with um, us and some of whom are not, and also Millie, who has joined us this year as the Secretariat Support. So uh, this is kind of a, I guess it's a community, it's kind of a committed and rich community that's come together and continue to do this work for a while. So thank you and welcome, and um, very glad to have you with us today. So for the first part of the session, we will share a little bit with you about this year's BPF work, what we are focusing on. Um, and then we will also get some insights from practitioners who've been doing some of this work with different communities who are sitting here with me. Um, because I guess the IGF is really the best place to get a gathering of really rich insights and experience from people doing different work in this area. So this is what we're hoping and aiming to do um, for today, for the next hour and a half. Uh, so first of all, let's go through a little bit around, ah, cool. Uh, so a little bit around some history and background to the IGF. Um, so this year we are focusing on access, but focusing on the challenges and needs faced by specific communities of women in relation to meaningful access to the internet. Meaningful access meaning really access that enables the realization of the human rights um, that then also is not just about access to infrastructure or connectivity, but access for what, you know, to what purposes and end. Um, and the idea is that it is access that directly responds to some of their needs and interests, and therefore it is important for us to unpack what some of this means. 
Um, just to give you a little bit of background, um, which I've shared a little bit, this is our third year. On the first year in 2015, we focused on online abuse and gender-based violence, and this has produced a, a pretty lengthy report, and I think to date it's actually still one of the most comprehensive um, documents around looking at online gender-based violence and abuse. Um, and then in 2016, which is last year, we focused on access. This produced the report as well, and, rele and we released also an infographic on the online gender-based violence work for the previous year. Both of these documents can be found on the IGF website, um, and uh, they're actually quite, um, they'll be, they're quite worth looking through. Um, it's, sort of, it's quite a rich amount of data in relation to this, insights and data. And this year, it's uh, ongoing work in relation to the IGF, around, uh, in relation to the BPF, in relation, uh, <sighs> too many in relation to. Okay, so this year, <laughs> it's ongoing work in relation to this year's BPF, focus on specific communities of women. Um, and the reason for this is because we started the work quite late. Um, we started, I think, sometime in June. So this year's BPF work really started quite late. Um, and as you know, <laughs> the work schedule of the world starts to get really crazy in the second half and, and the last quarter. Um, but nonetheless, we really managed, we, de we managed to develop a kind of a methodology of work that really matured from the previous two years. So year one, we got together, we had regular meetings, we developed a survey, we outreached to different sessions and platforms and spaces. Year two, we continued to do some of this as well as had a survey. And year three, we thought if we're, we have less time, uh, and we also wanted to go more granular. We wanted to go deeper into, um, into this particular issue. So we split up the BPF work into focal groups. So different focal points then focused on particular community of women. And, but before that, we developed, again, a kind of a survey or more like a, yeah, a survey as well as a set of questions to help us, to guide us through this um, information gathering and uh, perspective um, gathering process as well. So um, let me just make sure that I'm thanking all of the different focal points. Uh, so we have Smitha who's not here with us. She did the foc she's the focal point person for LGBTQ women. Um, and then we have Anri who, and Danaraj who looked at refugee women. Um, together with the, so each focal point worked with a group of people, um, which was really great. And some of them um, outreached by distributing the survey to different groups, and some of them actually used the survey and went to different groups to do interviews um, with people that they're working with. Um, and then we had Serene, who was working on indigenous women, Bruna, who was working with young women, um, and then um, we had two other groups of women, which was women with disabilities, um, as well as women living in rural areas. But these two sort of didn't really get as much responses, unfortunately. Um, but these are the ones where you have, I guess, both a huge amount of need as well as a huge amount of research that's being done. So we hope that we can continue this work up until maybe June 2018 and um, take it from there. So that's where we are. So why did we choose to focus on specific groups of women, uh, specific communities of women? Firstly, it's because we understand that the issue of gender and access is one that a lot of uh, attention and resources has been put into, and that is really fantastic. Um, part of this is driven by SDG Goal 5, because it's the understanding that access and control over the internet can enable, can support um, efforts towards gender equality, as well as enable empowerment of all women. So then let's pause in equality and let's pause in all women. Um, equality and what does that mean? No, equality not just in terms of numbers, but also really in terms of substantive equality. And in order to get there, we really feel that the framework of human rights is the best framework to kind of like um, guide this. What does meaningful access um, and equality mean in terms of the realization of the full range of rights? And we also understand that rights um, is also the realization of rights and the, the ability to be able to um, see this fulfilled in your everyday life also is dependent upon the multiple forms of intersecting um, realities and often discrimination that you face. So let's sort of drill down a little bit towards that as well and um, focus on all women and all women, I mean, even if you look in this room, there, there's no such thing as like one category or group of women that shares everything. So let's break this down a little bit more. Let's understand what all women means. And we started by breaking this down just into these five, um, initially sort of five subgroups of women to begin with. 
Um, and this came out also a little bit from the work from last year, last year's VPF, to see, okay, these are information that we would like to, um, yeah, these are information that will benefit from deeper research, deeper analysis. Um, let's try and outreach this a little bit more as well because much of the research happens um, also a little bit at a macro level, no? because this is important. Data and quantitative statistics is really important. And so how do we also complement this and deepen the understanding by going um, into specific communities? So, so that's kind of, uh, that's the primary reason why we chose to focus on um, the five groups of women. I've spoken already about the methodology and approach and I won't go too much deep into it. And here I will share with you a little bit about the survey summary. Um, to be honest, this is not representative in no way <laughs> at all, right? Um, we received 29 survey responses, which is um, really great given the time frame that we had. Um, there was about 168 unfinished responses, which breaks my heart, <laughs> but that also happens with surveys. Um, but on top of this, it's also um, interviews that was being carried out that is not included in these survey responses, uh, where Focal Points took some of the surveys and went to different communities and asked questions, or people who worked with specific communities and asked questions. We did have quite, an, quite a nice um, distribution of um, around uh, through different regions, but of course regions are very, very big, and this is also just a touch of what it could include. Um, it's great to see that Africa had 13 responses uh, from the region, so that's something that we are um, happy with. <laughs> um, so for the, so just moving, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time talking through the findings because of course it's really like, as I said, no, it's in no way representative, but it's useful for us to just get a little bit of a sense of the context in order to be able to highlight the specific needs and therefore the specific challenges, and also maybe to an extent surface um, the specific value of meaningful access to these groups of women. So firstly on refugee women. So some of the needs, um, that were included, as you can see above, is about connecting with relatives and families and accessing important information, and challenges includes lack of public access facilities, movement restrictions, cultural norms, and discrimination playing a large role. Um, so in a way, it's kind of like about the importance of having access to the internet. It's a bit like being able to connect to the past, which is being able to connect to families and the country of origin that you've left behind. And it's also about connecting to the future. It's about future options. What is there available for me um, to be able to increase my education and my skills and my capacities to be able to sort of carve a path ahead. And there's also a spatial expansion um, possibility with access to the internet. With very limited mobility and, ex and restrictions, then the internet sort of gives you this access to a different kind of a space that opens it up. So this is a quote from one of the respondents. Um, access to information, the sharing of knowledge is, I can't actually pronounce this word, what is it? Sine qua non? Sine qua non? What language is it? Latin. I speak so good Latin. Uh, is the sine qua non of empowerment and empowerment in one, one's own life while keeping in mind a critical sense essential to avoid falling into the illusion of miracle solutions, we believe that the internet and social networks represent in this respect an opportunity to exploit. Um, we also have with us um, Katie Drew who works at UNHCR um, who will be able to give us a more deeper insight on this as well as Josephine Militza who is working with Evelyn uh, Namara in helping us get this survey out. Uh, I mean, um, yeah, uh, who actually went and did interviews with um, refugee women through the survey. We'll speak to this a little bit more. Um, and then the next group we have are indigenous women. Uh, indigenous women actually sometimes share a lot of the same context needs as rural women because it's about being in sort of hard to reach locations. Um, so therefore, there is issues of uh, but on top of that, indigenous women also face issues of discrimination and exclusion. Um, it's also, a, so therefore access to the internet is also very much about engaging with public participation. It's about the advancement of their rights, it's about accessing government services um, on top of, um, on top of um, having to deal with the um, exclusion issues. And culture and heritage is also an important thing, um, as well as the kind of um, building of skills and capacity. 
So you can see there some of the needs include access to information, education, justice, and production of their own content and engagement with citizen journalism. And I think this also goes parallel and side by side mm -hmm. with a lot of um, civil society work in engaging with indigenous communities around the advancement of their human rights. So you can see the parallel kind of um, work happening there. Um, and this is a quote by um, uh, one of the respondents who works with um, indigenous as well as women in rural places in East Malaysia, where I'm from, and also where Serene is from, not East Malaysia, Malaysia. Um, and uh, this is very important, no? like East-West Malaysian politics, like don't play around. Um, <laughs> and uh, she works with uh, people who are uh, at high risk of HIV infection and who are also positive. Uh, HIV positive, and she says that access to the internet is important for women to gain access to the outside world because the windows to the outside world is often just confined through what is given by the government through terrestrial services, which means there's also quite a lot of propaganda that, that sort of comes through that, so the ability to be able to access alternative information is quite important. And then, the cat and then we looked at young women, uh, and for young women we found that the ability to express themselves is very important. Young women's context is often constrained through a lot of cultural norms about what you can or cannot say, about stuff that you're able to um, uh, appropriately demonstrate, I suppose. And a lot of it is actually also around um, sexuality and shame is a big factor. So it's around mobility as well. So um, access to the inf internet becomes really important for this expression and articulation of what it means to be a young woman. Um, and the circumvention of um, shame when looking for particular kinds of information, shame or judgment. No? But one of the biggest challenges that we've seen faced by young women in terms of um, a barrier to access to the internet is um, safety concerns, including online gender-based violence. And this is something that we have consistently found since the first year of the DPF in 2015. So it's uh, quite a critical issue to look at. So for example, you can see from this quote, um, the issue of, um, yeah, about as you are being able to find spaces to express yourselves online, then the kind of backlash to also suppress this expression is equally present and relevant. And then we have women with disabilities. And really, I don't even feel comfortable putting this up there. We really only got one response. Uh, but since then, I've had really amazing conversation with different people who's working on disabilities issues, um, which we hope to engage and be more, much more part of this process. Um, and can I just tell you a little story? <laughs> it's fascinating. So I happened to be, I just by happen chance met this woman who was working on disabilities issue for more than 10 years um, last week in a different meeting. And I was going, oh my God, I wished I met you earlier and that you're coming to the IGF so that you can tell us more about this issue. And she was saying, yeah, one of the things that she pointed out to me, so I asked her what is the you know, intersection between technology and the work that you do with the communities that you do. And she said, it is massive. Like the role of technology in terms of advancing, not advancing, but making much more, um, I don't know how to say, but the impact on uh, the lives of people with disabilities has been really huge. And she walked through one of it with me. So one is really around mobility and isolation, no? And this goes from a whole range from physical disabilities to um, learning disabilities. And sometimes it's not that you can't go out, but that your guardian or your carer kind of like, you know, are not able to take you out. So mobility is a big thing. Um, and she was talking about the deaf community and how for the deaf community, they are signing, right? And for them, they don't see themselves sometimes as a group of people who are, they don't see themselves as a community of people living with disabilities. They see themselves as a linguistic community. So you have, but then what happens with signing is that you often don't learn the national language because you're signing, you have your own language. But a younger generation of people who are hearing impaired are using WhatsApp to communicate a lot more, which means now they are learning a national language, which then narrows the divide between those who are the speaking community and the deaf community. But it is widening the divide within the deaf community between those who are signing and doesn't under, don't speak the national language and the younger community who's using text and maybe don't sign as much. So there's kind of this very interesting movement that is happening within this work that I feel maybe we don't pay as much attention to on issues of access. We have a lot more understanding around people who are visually impaired and the intersection with technology, but less so with other kinds of disabilities that might be worth um, delving into. So, okay, 
And then um, LGBTQI women, the context is of course one that is often of, in most countries, it's criminalized, if not, it is against, it's either criminalized or it's against the kind of heteronormative norms. Um, so then the internet becomes a very, very important space for interpersonal relating, for community building, for them to be able to find other people to share experiences of, ex of exclusion from as simple things as coming out to their families, to connecting with others, to dating, um, and, ex and also to access information that are simply and explicitly banned, censored, or simply just not available. Uh, because about diverse and queer sexualities or information about health that is not um, heteronormative. And um, in the survey findings as well, one of the respondents cited that access to the internet has been really important for trans people to do very simple things like online banking because of your identity, um, you know, your legal identity documentation and how you look like and just circumventing all of that um, issue. And then women in rural areas, uh, which shares a little bit with refugee, uh, not refugee, um, indigenous women. It's about access to information, education, participation in democratic processes and challenges includes um, cost and infrastructure availability, um, which is a big thing. So that's kind of it for me so far. Um, and if you have thoughts or questions, please kind of like um, lock them down because we will really have an opportunity to unpack it. But first, let's hear also from our um, uh, incredible um, group of um, discussants who've done really great work um, in, this, in this area. Um, first of all, Katie Drew, who is the lab manager for communicating with communities at UNHCR, and she has previous experience with Safe Gay Children and CDAC. Okay, good morning, everyone. I have to admit that I'm standing in for my colleague, Samantha, who specifically works on connectivity for refugees. Um, and we have a report that was produced in 2016 that's probably worth having a look into because it's got a lot more details. Just to highlight, actually, that it doesn't nuance into the level of um, gender disaggregation that maybe that we're going to discuss today. So I just wanted to sort of bring out those, those issues a little bit more. Um, I think it's important to note, I know that we've broken it down into groups already, but actually just to highlight that not all refugee women live in camps, and actually 60% of our current population don't live in camps. So I think it's very important as we conceptualize how we are going to meet these challenges, we think about the women living in urban areas, um, because they're very often invisible, and how do we reach out to those? Also when we think about um, the camp environment, how do we move away from uh, centralized services to a more sort of uh, devolved way of, of meeting women and women's needs? Because we know that it's very challenging for women to walk across a camp to a centralized service, maybe an internet cafe, for example, because of various cultural norms and various sort of um, traditional practices that might mean that it's not possible for them to get there. So, yep, as I said, only 40% of our refugee women live in rural locations, but in those locations, we found that only 17% of those locations have access to 3G connectivity. So we're looking at a very, very low level of um, data connectivity on your mobile phone. And the mobile phone is the primary uh, device that refugees use to access the internet. Um, even in urban areas as well, we found this. So I think it's also really important that behind this, we look at the sort of general backdrop where we see that in um, middle income and low income countries, women are 21% less likely to own a mobile phone than a man. And we actually see that those numbers are, are higher in refugee populations, especially ones that have recently been displaced. Many times they've not been able to carry their mobile phone across the border for fear or for confiscation. They get damaged on the way. Um, so access to, to devices is really one of the critical challenges that women face. They are extremely expensive for them. And in a new emergency situation when refugees have just arrived to a new location, they don't have the disposable income to spend on assets like this. One of the specific challenges that women face, or well, refugees face, um, but sometimes women more so, is the documentation requirements that is needed in a new country to access a SIM card, and what registration do they need, and whether they're legally able to access a SIM card. So very often we find that refugees are excluded from being able to um, access SIM cards legally, and 
women, because of literacy levels, might not be able to fulfill in the documentation or apply for a SIM card, even if they can do so. So that's one of the specific challenges around access to devices, pricing plans. The second most uh, important challenge that we, we found um, was digital literacy and uh, women's ability to access the internet based on the languages that they speak. Very often they might not have accessed schools, so they don't speak the national languages of the country, local languages which aren't facilitated on the internet and maybe aren't necessarily written capacities that they have in these languages. So that's a very important aspect. And again, I think it's uh, around confidence to use these devices and the cultural constraints, even taboos around women owning these devices, having access to the internet and um, power dynamics that mean that women might not be encouraged to have access to information. We have to really think about the, the situations that we're working in. Um, so I just wanted to provide a couple of examples to sort of highlight some of these challenges. Um, one was in Uganda, for example, um, where women were sort of explaining to me, um, oh, we don't need to um, pay money for charging our mobile phone. And on the surface, that's great. Okay, so you go to a charging station that sort of pop up in new settlements. We see them with solar panels and you don't need to pay money. But when we dug into this a little bit deeper, it was clear that there were other transactions that were taking place. Um, on a less um, sensitive note, maybe swapping rations, which means they are more vulnerable from, from malnutrition, but swapping other things, other transactional things that we need to look at the protection environment that these women are living in and the vulnerabilities and how important it is for them to access information and what we can do to mitigate those risks so that women don't need to have transactions in order to be able to access um, charging, credit and devices. Um, one of the other things I think that we should look at is the, the, the power and maybe the danger of the information that women are accessing. Uh, one is based on an example from an urban area in Egypt where women were um, provided SMS text messages to their mobile phone, um, uh, providing sort of links to additional information around family planning. And actually women reported that there'd been an increase in domestic violence because they weren't able to delete the messages if they didn't know how to. Um, maybe they're only used to using their mobile phone for voice calls, etc. And when their husbands or a male member of the family had found the message on their phone, they were accused of infidelity. Um, so this is a real sort of issue around how do we make sure that we're protecting women to be able to, to competently use that information without it in endangering them in other situations. Um, there's many, many other points that I could talk about. I think one for us as uh, UNHCR is specifically around sus sustainability challenges of providing internet access to um, communities and to women's communities. So for example, we have um, uh, satellite connection to um, some of the camps on the border between Democratic Republic of Congo and Central African Republic. These are great and they're really well used and I've seen women's literacy classes running, women are very well, um, well they're very comfortable to access the internet and they were pleased to use this and they've set up their own women's livelihoods group. On the, on the sort of back side of that is the expense that it costs to be able to get that satellite connectivity there and how feasible is it as an organization or as a group of humanitarian organizations to continue to provide that and at what point can that sustainability and that ownership be taken over by a community that has very limited access to disposable income. And I think for us that's the challenge. It's not getting the technology there, it's keeping the technology there and the ownership of the technology. So. Um, yeah, I mean, we can talk in the breakaway groups a little bit more, but yeah, that's, that's my <laughs> list of first challenges. So. Thank you so much, Katie. That's like super rich already. I'm going to have to play that in slow motion. Uh, and um, Josephine? Ah, okay, Josephine, would you like to just give us, share with us some of your insights that you gained through your work with Abby? Uh, my name is Josephine from Kenya. I'm an ISOC ambassador. Uh, the research we did in collaboration with Evelyn from ISOC and our focus on, on Kakuma refugee camp, which is in the northern part of Kenya. And the refugee has a population of uh, 184,938 refugees and asylum seekers. 
and women constitute of more than 50% of the population. So uh, due to time, we were able to, it was a very a small sample of women that we talked to and mostly were between the ages of 20 to 29 years. Uh, talking to them, their needs for access, it was number one, the main thing was communication. As refugees, you find that most of your relatives live outside uh, of the camp. And so in terms of just finding out how they are doing, and the main platforms for communications were Twitter, WhatsApp, and Facebook. They also have a need for financial access, so their relatives send money uh, to them using platforms like World Remit and PayPal. And also in Kenya, mobile money is very, it's almost like 90% of the population have access to mobile money, and the main platform is M-Pesa, which is used to make uh, payments. Then uh, the other need was education. There is an NGO in the camp that has partnered with Regis University and they are able to access online education. So they use uh, the internet to do research and also submit their assignment. There are some who are interested in finding online jobs uh, to help them uh, get uh, income generating. And the last one was entertainment. Most were interested in seeing how they can be able to access YouTube uh, and other forms of entertainment online. Barriers to access, it was the first thing was cost to connectivity and also cost to the devices. Uh, they lack funds to afford devices, e.g. smartphones and laptops, as well as affording uh, connectivity. So one of the ladies says the challenge I face is to get money uh, to buy me a, a smartphone. And also there are some areas in the refugee camp where the, the connectivity is very poor. So they have to go to those areas at certain time. And when it's late, it becomes a security issue for women. Electricity in the camp is also not uh, very good and so they have to pay to be able to access uh, generators. And one of the quotes was that it is difficult in, uh, for you to charge your phone and a laptop since we don't have sufficient electricity in the camp. For instance, we hire electricity wires from generator owners, which when it rains, uh, you do not have access to the charging. And then they pay a thousand Kenyan shillings, uh, which is like $10 for them to be able to charge. Access to relevant content. So there was a quote uh, by one of the women who said, lack of le relevant content for women and girls in the internet. So far, I haven't found anything that I can, that I can be able to focus on that is important. There's also lack of skills on accessing the internet. Uh, so when you asked her, she said, no, I have never applied anywhere using the internet because I lack the information on how to get uh, job opportunities and also on how to use the internet. Uh, the last barrier was cultural barriers, and that is many women in the camp, uh, because once you're married, some are not allowed by their husbands either to own a mobile device or to access social media. So in terms of uh, what they would like to, to be done, they said uh, awareness of the importance of the internet uh, would be key for them because most of, most of them just see it as an opportunity to maybe go online and use it uh, for entertainment and not really as a way to get education and also to earn money. Then access to devices that enable them to connect, uh, more knowledge and skills on how to use the internet and improvement in electricity in the camp. Thank you. Thank you so much, Josephine. And I think the two presentation really gives us a really good sense of our different dimensions of um, this particular group of women. So next, let's move to Serene, who will talk to us a little bit more about um, indigenous women. Hi. Um, just want to give a bit of context. Uh, so what I'm about to say is, um, it's entirely based on my interactions and conversations with indigenous women who have the leave experience, um, which I don't. So I, I spoke to about um, indigenous women from four countries, um, and these are Malaysia, Indonesia, Myanmar, and Thailand. Um, 
I think one of the things that keeps striking me is, um, like what Jack said earlier, um, there's no such thing as one category for all women, and this include for Indigenous women as well. Um, it's almost impossible to pinpoint like a cut, cr cut across um, barriers or usage when it comes to internet. Um, so, and not all of them live in remote areas. Some of them have actually integrated their life into um, urban and suburban areas. Uh, and in places where there's internet access, <coughs> excuse me, whether it's urban or in remote areas, right, um, it's being used um, for a wide range of purposes, um, from activism to social. Um, and sort of like one of the recurring theme, uh, and this was seen in the interviews uh, I did in Myanmar, Indonesia, and Malaysia, is that women are saying that, um, in their opinions, that they're not using internet for the good reason, or they're not using internet properly. Um, when I ask them why, and they say they're using internet to, to meet people, to talk to men outside of their village, to form relationships, to watch YouTube and various content. Um, and then when I ask what contents, right, it's, you know, for entertainment, for dancing, and, and to learn things. Um, I think there's also the division of good, of what is good and bad internet, and also how women perceive um, their, u their own usage of internet as sort of less important. Um, and some of the barriers that was um, that, that came out from the conversation I had, um, one of it, the main one remains availability and affordability of, um, of internet. Um, it remains unavailable in many parts of the community. And I've also seen places where um, people can afford mobile phone, but charging it can be an issue um, because there's no electricity in the village. So they have to rely on solar powers or generators or even when they can afford data plan, um, the quality of connection is not the same as what we get in, um, in urban area. And in places where there is internet access, um, capacities and skills, lack of confidence in using technology and mobile phone um, becomes a barrier. Um, this is especially um, obvious among elderly women. Um, in one of the interview with an activist in Myanmar, um, she said that the reason, one of the reasons is because men tend to have better opportunity um, in learning technology because um, they go out more often to run errands. So they learn, meet people, and they talk, and that's how they pick up um, the skill as compared to women. Um, and then the next barrier, it's also time, um, which was something that was also, um, that was reported in the 2016 um, BPF outcome document. Um, similarly, indigenous women have multiple responsibility. They have to work in farm, family farm, plantations, or any other forms of economic activities. And on top of that, they are expected to do unpaid care works at home. And even during community events or celebrations, women are expected to do the work, to, to, sorry, to do the work of planning, cooking, serving, and cleaning for the community. And this represents a real opportunity cost from public participation in the local event. And there's also the barriers um, of lack of relevant content, um, mainly uh, around language, or they simply don't see how internet is needed in their life. But I felt um, we need to be mindful and to really um, unpack exactly why do they not see the need um, of internet. And lastly, um, power relations within um, these communities are extremely, uh, are extremely important. Um, even when internet is available, it doesn't mean that they will have access or meaningful access to internet. Um, a research by my organization, Empower, um, shows that even indigenous women in Malaysia experience gender-based violence online. Um, and these are from people within their own community. Um, and this happens on the closed platforms created only for the indigenous community. The research shows that it is indigenous women who ultimately bear the burden of these insecurities of years of systemic marginalization and oppression from the state and also corporations. So as we see the powerless goes against the might of state, they took it out on the women in their own communities. Um, this really suggests a strong perception that women, even within these communities, are deemed to have um, uh, an inferior status as compared to men. And there's also 
often this pressure of the need to stand together, you know, um, in solidarity with the more important issues, which are land grabbings or political representations, or to not betray the leaders or those who are at the front line of the, the fight, um, who are often predominantly men. So somehow issues of gender-based violence or harassment online is seen as less important and often goes unspoken and unheard. So one of the respondents in our research actually left um, the platforms and also the online network that she was part of it as a result of gender-based violence online. Um, and we, are, we also see another respondent who, even though do not directly experience the attack, but through her observations of the experience of the others, has somehow censored the way um, she speaks online or she has to refrain herself from defending the others who face oppression. Thank you. Thank you so much, Serene. Um, Serene is the uh, Research and Resource Development Officer from Empower, which is a women's rights organization that advocates for women's political equality in Malaysia and a fellow colleague and partner in crime for many things. <laughs> um, so next, let's move to kind of looking at youth and maybe some of the intersection between youth and um, uh, Rural urban divide. Let's start with Bruna Santos um, from Brazil, who is Internet Society's IGF 2017 ambassador and member of the Special Interest Group Youth Observatory. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Um, yeah, hi. <laughs> so, um, as explained by Jackie, um, we divided the whole um, study object of the BPF in groups, and the one I was left with was not left with, but embraced was the youth one. And um, starting like delving into the subject, we are the digitally native um, generation. We are born with the internet. We started doing it ever since the beginning. We wake up with our phones in our hands. We sleep with our phones in our hands. We eat, live, buy, pretty much do anything online. And this is our lives. I mean, I'm talking to you guys. I have my phone like, right here. I was Instagram storing the session, so that's part of it. But <laughs> despite all of this like closeness to internet, we still face some barriers. And this, th they can be like more or less um, given the regional and geographical context that we find ourselves into. So um, when looking at to the survey's answers, we found that at least I, I looked into four great groups of barriers. The first one was safety and concerns. The second one was affordability and availability. Um, the third one would be digital literacy, and um, the fourth and last one would be the, the thing we aim for the most and dream about is gender equity and access to opportunity. Um, on the affordability and availability, that uh, part of it, um, the problem was the lack of affordable devices. We are still on our like very b early stage of our careers. We don't have access to like a lot of money where some of us still rely on their parents or not and therefore like we don't even sometimes we don't even have money to um, buy phones to a have access to internet via, via mobile and um, on the digital literacy note um, this is the generation that goes on with the internet so we learn a lot from it we profit from it at some time at some points but some girls in some situations, they don't have access to internet given to cultural norms or um, any situation that you find yourself in. So if girls are not educated, we won't be able to navigate the web, even in their own language. Um, thirdly, on the gender equity and access to opportunity, um, I will go back to the cultural barriers, which are, I mean, we, we still face like some cases of really young stay-at-home stay moms, child marriage, stereotypes that we have to face given our like cultural norms or situations. Um, for an example, like some, your parents might not enjoy the internet because they think there's a lot of like porn online. So you won't be able to access it because of some social convention or prejudice. And also the biggest thing, the most concerning thing, which is the stereotype around the concept that Technology is something strictly for men, so we won't be <laughs> at least profiting from it. On the, like, kind of finish the barriers, the last one was the safety concerns. So if I start pointing out questions, we face violence against women online, we face um, revenge porn, we face body shaming, 
and ratings. We have <coughs> apps for rating women, rating your friends. We used to have them. So it's um, like having been the generation that live in it, we worry a lot more about the internet than others do. So it's like some review about me or the, the speech I'm trying to give this right now goes online. I don't know what will happen. I mean, I will feel like, I, I feel like this generation will give like more um, attention to what's written online than others. So whatever goes online about us is it's kind of hard. We also use it like the safety concerns also goes under the like dating area and such going back to sexuality as well. Um, we have apps for dating. So we work like this today. So if, if we go on a date, you start to worry whether or not the person is real or anything is going to happen to you. So um, last but not least, um, find, we, we tend to find a lot of information online. So I was like talking to some friends recently and I found out that a lot of my friends while, while growing up asked many, many questions on their sexuality online, not to the parents. So, I mean, before like facing your parents and talking about, hi mom, I just had my first time, they went online to see what would happen. So, and yeah, so, and while, and in this research we faced, we found a lot of like really good interesting initiatives, um, which I will mention two of them. The, the one of the most interesting was Hamara, Hamara Internet, uh, translated to Our Internet, which is an uh, initiative to raise awareness of dig digital violence against women in Pakistan. So they have a hot site for teaching women what is online harassment and how to tackle it, and what steps people should follow when facing it. And they also are doing a roadmap called Putting, putting Evil on the, on the Map, in which they take like Pakistan's map and try to point out where anything is happening. So, the second one is Chicas in Technology, Chicas in Tecnología, a Latin initiative um, trying to empower women, little girls, middle school girls, on how to code and by enabling them to work on tech and teaching them not to fear it. So, I guess I'll finish around here and we'll talk later. Thank you so much, Bruno. Um, and let's move to Chennai. Um, so Chennai works with Research ICT Africa, who does amazing work around research on access and ICT, in, like the name says, no, <laughs> in the region. Um, <coughs> thanks very much, Jack. Um, yeah, I think we do uh, amazing work. <laughs> um, given that I think we're like one of the few organizations um, on the continent that does this. So um, I'll be talking about youth and rural women as well. And um, in this last year, we, uh, we conducted a focus group study in Tanzania, Rwanda, and uh, Nigeria, where we wanted to understand how it is that youth make use of the internet. And we focused on the age group of 15 to 19 and 20 to 24. And um, this comes from our understanding that experiences of young people are completely different. And um, when you break it down, it, so teens have different experiences in comparison to young adults. So what we found was that um, gender challenges were really standing out for young women, where the perceptions of young women were that of that they were not trusted by the communities that they stayed in or that their lives were heavily monitored and controlled when it came to um, internet use. We found that in rural Tanzania, for example, women were seen as troublemakers, likely to get pregnant or fall out of school, so there wasn't mu as much investment that was done for their education. In urban Tanzania, we found that for young women who were trying to get work, they were more likely to face some form of sexual harassment from older male employers who were asking for sexual favors in order for them to secure employment. And then we also found that um, in places like Rwanda, parents were reluctant to see their children, to see young women leave the houses um, to get employment because they felt like they weren't sure what it is that they were going to do with their lives. And then um, in Nigeria, we found that young women's movements were closely monitored and this was similar across all countries. So in essence, if your point of access to the internet is a public um, is a public access point, for example, a public Wi-Fi or a library, 
um, your movement were likely to be limited by the parents who thought, who were not sure what it is exactly you're going to do or who didn't trust that you were actually going to make it to the internet cafe. So what we found was that there were a lot of um, beyond, we call them beyond access challenges that actually impact um, negatively on young women's experiences when it comes to um, internet access and use. And from there on, um, I think once again, what has been coming out is the issue around power dynamics and power barriers, where young men also perceive themselves as being better than young women and feeling like they have some kind of more responsibility to, um, to their families and that young women are more have more of the family responsibilities. So you're not expected to be in an internet cafe you're, or, or making use of the internet on your own mobile device. You're expected to be um, taking care of family responsibilities. So your time to actually make use of the internet is quite limited. So um, what we found as well that should possibly be a possible intervention when it comes to young women and internet access around relevant content that the content that's online is not as relevant to the young women in the countries that we interviewed. And it also became a language issue where as most of the content is in English, but English is not um, a language that young women, but these participants were um, quite comfortable with. And then um, also we did find that young women were making productive use of the internet. They were using it to post um, videos. One young woman had started a modeling agency and she was making use of the internet to share the content, but the biggest challenge was around the community support of young women as entrepreneurs when it comes to uh, making use of the internet. So for us, what was clear was that um, having provision for access in terms of saying that, okay, we've made access affordable, we've made access available in these public places, will be faced by the barrier of the cultural norms associated with perceptions for young women, and that the question is, how do we shift the cultural perceptions that impact on young women's access to the, to the internet? So that's for young women. And then um, for rural women, what we do know, um, and this, is, this would be for rural women and rural men, is that supply side challenges are still an issue. When it comes to having access to, a good, um, to good connectivity where you've got, or you've got wider coverage of the internet in your rural community, um, or quality of network, so that you don't have to go and climb up a tree to be able to access the internet, or you don't have to go climb a hilltop. And then you've also got issues around ownership of devices. So in some households, people are sharing a device. So then that's one issue um, that is actually agreed upon and people are working around it. But once again, the cultural issues um, come into play and the power dynamics that impact on levels of access and use. So you find that um, we, um, women in rural areas are expected to, once again, be the one in, ones in charge for family responsibilities. So your time online is quite limited. Um, in fact, we had one respondent saying, you find that women are burning the chicken because they're on the internet. Who has ever burnt the chicken? So, <laughs> so um, and since this was based on qualitative focus groups that we did, and what it is quite interesting, the perceptions that men have towards what they expect women to be doing. They don't expect women to be online, they expect women to be in the house and running the house. And then when you think about it as well, even though there have been provisions around public, ac public access points, um, you find that you, they, not, they can't necessarily be in these public access points because it becomes a question of trust and power dynamics. Where have you been? What have you been doing? And in some communities where um, gender-based bi violence is rife, you find that for the sake of peace, uh, women opt not to be online at a particular time. We had an, in, uh, an instance in one of the communities that we, worked, we interviewed in South Africa where the participant said that um, she's asked her partner to not go online, but, and so they stopped going online at a certain time of the day, but for her it's more of an issue that um, she's more likely to face gender-based violence if she breaks this rule, or in some instances people get married and they're no longer online. So um, once again, I think one of the interventions that has come uh, issues is around unpacking cultural issues that limit uh, women's access, to, that impact on women's access and use of the internet. And then uh, once again, digital literacy, where we find that respondents simply want to know what the internet is and having access to devices, where in some instances devices are more expensive, and also having choice that urban um, participants have, where in some rural areas we've only got 
um, one or two operators, and the operators that are in there are actually the most expensive. So yeah, those are my interventions. Thank you so much. I'm realizing that suddenly, like, you know, with this sinking feeling, we're rapidly running out of time and there's still a lot of speakers and we wanted to do breakout groups. So I don't think this breakout groups thing is going to happen, <laughs> but we will try to get, like, enough time for a conversation going after all of the interventions anyway and apologize for this and hopefully you have a ton of things to say still. Okay, so, okay, so now let's... So we've talked a little bit about the different groups and the different kinds of barriers and challenges and now we'd like to change... Um, shift gear a little bit to look at pot potential responses. And we have two people with us who work on community access networks in quite different areas. And it's quite exciting. I think I find this to be quite an exciting response towards addressing some of the access issues, especially looking at very, very specific, um, I guess, locales um, and communities. So first we have Carlos, uh, Carlos Ray Moreno, who's with APC. And he's currently heading a project on looking at community access networks in various locations, no? So Carlos, who is very nervous, by the way. Thank you very much, <laughs> Jack. Uh, yes, well, it's a total honor for me to be in this panel and be able to share a bit the experience that I've been uh, seeing while living in rural areas of South Africa and implementing uh, together with a community, a community network there. Uh, I'm by no means an, a, a gender expert, and I, I have learned so much listening to you all. Uh, in this, in this panel. Um, so in a way, stepping back and maybe focusing on the, on the project that we are currently heading, we believe that some of the challenges that all of you have been mentioning uh, might be embedded in the paradigm of the access as being provided by mobile network operators and big companies that are outside the communities where this access is being provided, and therefore they have no interest and no connections with the realities of what is happening there. And by the communities themselves engaging in the discussions around providing themselves with their own connectivity to meet their own con communication needs, there is a good opportunity to explore how these challenges that women and girls in communities are facing. Um, but there is not that much evidence. There is uh, not that many opportunities to explore that. Actually, I believe there is one single paper, an academic paper, looking at gender and, 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 and community networks, uh, where my, with my colleague uh, Tigis Sewarega and uh, also Nicola Bidwell, that is the person looking at gender and, and, and in, in this project that I'm that I'm heading. And in this project that we are heading, we're actually trying to explore uh, precisely that. Uh, we are gonna go and do uh, exploratory research in six, six communities to understand what is happening with regards to gender participation in these community networks, right? Uh, one, the first one actually that we are gonna go visit is, is Grandma Gansarvani is gonna tell you all about it, right? But how actually we can learn from this brave women that has have overcome uh, cultural norms and other patterns that, well, Sarvani here, Josephine from Tunapanda that she just spoke before, they are among the few women that are leading community networks, right? The community networks space is very male dominated, but somehow, unluckily, I believe, uh, is very open to explore this. There are several community network leaders or champions or however you want to call them that we want to to see how we can open the space for more women participation and we simply don't know how. So it's also an invitation to, to a dialogue in between both genders and I think Jack and in the, well, the yesterday we had a dinner about local access and community networks and, and many conversations came to, to the floor in this regard and I think it was very nice that this di dialogue is, is starting to to appear because in my experience as well with Sensaleni Network, something that happened is that by the two male local champions to come into these events, to, to hearing all these challenges, to even doing research in the communities and understanding how there is these gender gaps in the participation, in the access, in the 
they are becoming more aware on, of, of how to try to implement mechanisms to, to, to allow the participation of more, more women. So, yeah, I think it's a, it's a dialogue. And, and I think uh, I, I'm going to leave it there. And maybe in the questions we can continue discussing because with Sarban in the panel, I don't have anything to say. <laughs> Oh, shit. Thanks, Carlos. And apparently there's quite a few nervous people. I didn't realize. Mm -hmm. Like, suddenly I'm getting tweets. Um, Dr. Sabani Banaji Balur is someone I actually met yesterday evening and had one of the best conversations of my life. I'm totally geeking out on understanding community access and the technology behind it and TV white space. So I'm really looking forward to your input. Yeah. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, thanks, Jack. Uh, I, uh, thanks, Jack, for giving me the opportunity to speak here. Uh, I am a senior research scientist at the Grammar uh, Rural Broadband Project at the Indian Institute of Technology, uh, IIT Bombay. Uh, we have been working on uh, providing connectivity uh, to empowering uh, women, I mean empowering rural India digitally. Uh, we have been working on this project since the year 2012. And uh, we have, uh, we set up, uh, so, so we, we, ta we take locations or villages that are completely unconnected. So they are not connected with even 2G and 3G signal. So if you look into the connectivity scenario in India, 640,000 villages in India don't have any connectivity at all. Out of which 50,000 villages don't even have voice connectivity. So the, so the, so the scenario is really grim and a lot of work needs to be done. Uh, Government of India is doing its level best to do uh, to lay the fiber uh, to reach all the uh, village uh, offices, but uh, then uh, laying a fiber is a very uh, tedious job, uh, wherein right of way and other issues come into uh, play. So what we do is that uh, since the year 2000, uh, we got a funding from Ford Foundation in the year 2013. And we connected uh, uh, seven villages in, uh, in rural uh, Maharashtra. Imagine 30 kilometers to 40 kilometers away from Mumbai, the metropolitan city, there is no connectivity. So you can imagine the state, uh, how it is in, uh, in the villages in India. Uh, so we took uh, seven villages and we connected it uh, through uh, the TV white space technology. We got the license from the Department of Telecommunication and we uh, connected it through that technology. Uh, these villages, and we did an impact assessment uh, of uh, what, how Im internet connectivity has influenced lives of people in the villages. Um, and we saw that it has really impacted a lot in terms of uh, money, time, and effort that they have uh, saved um, by not going to the nearby, look, uh, nearby city to do their internet activities, like in the sense that they have to have a lot of, um, uh, they have to pay electricity bill, there are, there are this agricultural land bills that they have to pay, caste certificate, death certificate, marriage certificate, for each, everything they had to go to the, to the nearby city. So they were doing it here. Now, um, after we, uh, uh, so after that, it was that these people, uh, they, uh, we decided, so the license was taken back by the government and uh, we were coming out of that place when these people told us that no, uh, can, you, can we have a community network of our own, wherein the network will be our own network. We will, uh, we, it's like it's going to be a network of the people, by the people, for the people. And uh, they asked us for handholding. And in the year 2015, we scaled it up to 25 villages. Again, we have taken villages, tribal locations that are uh, away from uh, Mumbai. And uh, these locations ha have no connectivity at all. So there are no, there are no ISPs going over there. There are no, there's no 2G signal over there. There's no 3G signal. So we have uh, connected them uh, with an optimal mix of technology, that is TV white space and 5.8. 5.8 gigahertz is an unlicensed band. TV white space, we still are waiting for the license, but uh, yeah, we have connected. Now, I would like to say that in these communities where we have, uh, where, where the network is now operational, it's a live test bed there. Um, uh, I would like to say about the women's participation in these community-led networks. Um, what I found is that uh, when I began the research in the year 2015, when I asked them, I asked these women over there that do you need internet connectivity? 
uh, they told, no, we don't need internet connectivity. There was absolutely no digital awareness in, uh, in the, in, amongst the people over there. Leave alone the women, but there's no absolutely no, uh, there's no awareness. Digital awareness is an important aspect. They, for, for, for understanding the benefits of internet, uh, to embrace internet connectivity, uh, they will not do so until and unless they're aware of internet. So it took us some time to actually handhold them, to tell them about what, what internet can do to them. So that is the reason why they, uh, they would like to use internet. Now we are talking about internet uh, as a fixed broadband. So we are actually not even talking about internet that we, they give it, we give it to them on the phones and everything. So it's going to be a village office. It's a village office where the internet connectivity is there. And that's where the women come, the men come, and they have, the, they have all the online certificates and everything. They do all the internet uh, uh, things over here, over at the village office. What uh, what I found, uh, what we find, what I am finding in these uh, villages is that women's participation is uh, is quite uh, an astounding thing, and what I see is that many of the villages in uh, the locations where we are doing, uh, uh, we are connecting, uh, are led by women headmen. So the women are the headmen of the village. So they have quite a lot of rights on how they can develop their own village through internet connectivity. And they take it up as a priority over other things. Like for example, they're also fighting against gender inequality. They are fighting against caste inequality. They are fighting against socioeconomic, uh, uh, they don't have that, uh, that, uh, that amount of uh, economic resources. So they are fighting against all these things. But in spite of these, they think as internet connectivity as, uh, as, a, as a right by which they, they need to have this as a right now. And uh, what I see is that uh, many of the women in the villages are facilitated by the by women being the headman of the village. If, the, if there is a woman who is a headman of the village, then she facilitates a lot of activities amongst the women to uh, d make them digitally aware, to even uh, provide them the space so women can't even, for example, if they have to look into something like um, some, uh, if they have uh, some uh, bodily issues, like uh, some something which they can't share with anyone in the village, they come to the uh, location, the village office, after five o'clock in the evening, when the office closes down, and they come there, and then they operate the internet. They use the internet over there. They close, then there was a security issue, so they go inside the office and they lock it from inside. So, uh, so these are some of the things. Uh, these are some of the um, some of the things uh, at our location, and um, yeah. So this is what I. If some questions, I would like to answer. Thank you so much. Thanks. So um, we have one more intervention. Are you? How are you doing? Are you doing okay? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. We're gonna try and like open this up super soon. Um, but we have one more intervention from Carla Licciardello. Um, sorry, I'm like mangling everyone's names, but this is like, I don't, okay, I'm not going to, not going to go there. Stop. Okay. Uh, who is the policy analyst of ITU um, based in Geneva, and she will tell us a little bit about ITU's initiatives in this. And I'm sorry if I have to kind of also ask you to be a little brief. Thanks. So thank you very much and uh, good morning to everyone. Um, thank you for, uh, for, for inviting us. So th just uh, um, a very quick update on, uh, on, on ITU's uh, uh, initiatives related to, to gender equality. As you know, the digital, the bridging the digital gender gap is, uh, is, uh, is one of the top priority for, for the ITU as part of the, of course, of the overall program of the digital inclusion. Um, so last, uh, as, as we reported already last year at the Best Practice Forum on Gender, uh, last year we launched uh, EQUAS, which is a global partnership to bridge the gender digital divide. Uh, that is a multi-stakeholder partnership, so we are working closely with uh, 
different organizations, uh, international organizations, private sector, but also civil society and, uh, and governments uh, under a, a common framework of action that is focusing on access, um, skills and, uh, and leadership. So uh, access, of course, providing access to women and girls. Uh, skills in a sense to equip uh, women uh, with, uh, with ICT studies and, uh, and leadership, uh, how to have more women on, on senior management position, uh, represented in senior management position in the tech uh, sector, but also how to have more women as, as entrepreneurs. So um, the, uh, the partnership was uh, uh, launched last year with five co-founders, so we are working very closely with GSMA. Uh, with the United Nations University, um, with ITC, the International Trade Center, and, and UN Women. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and the partnership uh, uh, is taking a kind of evidence-based approach. Uh, so we, uh, the UNU, uh, so United Nations University is leading up uh, a research group that is composed by 26 uh, uh, universities from all around the world. And actually, you know, we are very, I uh, will follow up with, with some of you later on because it's, it's very important to, to understand what is, you know, the research that we have developed on the ground so that then it can be taken into account uh, by, by the members of, of the research group. Um, since last year, we are also partnering uh, with, uh, with, with the IGF on, uh, on, uh, on the digital, uh, on a digital uh, um, inclusion map uh, that you will find it also under the equals.org website. Uh, that is a map that is basically showcasing uh, uh, initiatives around the world that are looking specifically at uh, uh, gender uh, equality uh, online. Um, the, map, the map now has, uh, again, thanks to the support of course of, uh, of, of the IGF and the Best Practice Forum, uh, it has, uh, and also uh, the government of Germany, uh, basically it has around 550 uh, projects uh, uh, mapped. Uh, we still have a long way to go because we know that a lot is happening on the ground. So if you don't find your initiatives in the map, it's not because uh, they don't exist, but it's actually because uh, with our researcher, we, we, we didn't manage actually to, cap to capture that, uh, the, the projects. So we will be around and uh, please send us your feedback in the map and, and we look forward to continuing uh, uh, working closely with uh, with the best practice forum. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, and really, I guess maybe like thanks to everyone who really input it. You know? It's good to clap. It brings up energy. So now the floor is officially open. I apologize for being um, yeah that we only have ten minutes, but um, it's really super important to hear what you think or if you have specific questions. And let's get them all at one go. Bonjour. Oh, good morning. I'm Charlotte from Côte d'Ivoire. And in my country, we have a similar problem that many countries in Africa. Difficult to internet access because sometimes it's expensive and uh, in some zones, we don't have internet. And not information access, so not opportunity. The woman don't know uh, some opportunity as this English content. In our course, we speak French, so it's all all opportunity, all content you can find is in, in English. So it's so difficult to know if you don't have uh, maybe a screen in English, the, this. And uh, we have online insecurity because in my country, since some years, uh, we have another uh, a, a phenomenon of brutal. The people use uh, the face of woman and use the face to create another profile to have the money. So now, when you want to apply in, or many in another opportunity, in another country, it's difficult because in some opportunity, our country is no uh, eligible, and it's it's also so uh, it's current uh, to see the, the same the similar problem in another country, but if we have some community and NGOs to try to help and encourage the woman to use the internet and also to to have a confidence, leadership, and many things through the training and the sensibilization, but it's difficult because the community have also to support. I don't know if in your different program you have uh, may maybe the, pro the, sim the particular program to support our community in Africa, Africa community, yeah. Thank you so much. Um, we're gonna take a couple more and then maybe get like a round of response. So is there any other kind of um, thoughts or inputs that you might want to share? Uh, 
Hello, uh, my name is Soledad Roybal. I um, am formerly with the U.S. State Department under the previous administration, and have also done work with the ITU um, and Equals. Um, I'm interested in hearing more about the need for a culture shift. Um, ultimately, it's an issue of equality as a whole, and I'm wondering where, uh, if people can talk more about the successes that they've seen in, in that, in convincing men in their communities the value in having women online and how we can really focus on that and also how we can honestly address some of the issues. Um, the woman from UNHCR mentioned the exchange of other things when I think it's important for us to be really honest about what some of those other things are and sometimes it's, it's often sex and women are put into very difficult positions when they are um, being forced to exchange sex to get their phones charged or, you know, things like that. And it's, how do we have those real, honest, open conversations about the fact that this is culture and how do we make those changes? Thank you. Thank you. Very good question. And um, Angie? Hi, perfect. Hi, I'm Angie, an ambassador of ISOC, and I want to talk uh, you about two projects uh, very fast. And the first is an IGF firm, the which was second year was organized in Mexico, and the August, and uh, it was held to Lucky uh, Lucky FM a meeting on the Sunday in Cerro Day and the first time on IGF and this uh, meeting. Uh, in, Mex in Mexico, uh, the IGF and is based on where to teach young women about internet governance and digital security and other issues and other problems and other things. Uh. Uh, the second, I invite uh, team collaborators and work together with new group special interests and women on internet society. There is, uh, there is space and finally to seek to collaborate and empower to women. And thanks. Thanks, Angie. Hi, my name is Kimi. I'm here with Yoda IGF from Brazil. And I wanted to ask more like for Bruna because she told uh, from Chicas in Tecnología. And I wanted to ask, because I do participate as an uh, ambassador on Technovation, which is also a program for teaching girls from 10 to 18 how to program, how to empower them, and how to create, they have like a work they can do by their own. And is there like a certain age that's good for us to teach them? Because as soon as we get older, like society is shaping us. They telling us you cannot do that. And I feel like when you're teaching a kid, and she's like 10 years old. For, for her, it's like the entire world can be like at his, her hand. So um, is there um, a age okay. or something that we can do for it? An ideal Thank age you. for challenging steer. I think it's a lifelong thing, but okay, good question. Um, so is there any other ones? And then maybe we've got really just five minutes left. And I guess I would really just like to go through bearing in mind, okay, very quickly, one sentence, who you are and so on. Absolutely. Um, I just want to say uh, something very quickly. Um, my name is Carolina. I'm with LACNIC, which is a, a regional internet registry for Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, and I wanted to sort of uh, raise the issue about how we bridge the digital gap in uh, the sort of very advanced technical community. Um, LACNIC is sort of working on uh, sort of its gender uh, agenda quite strongly. Uh, we don't have, as of yet, I guess, uh, best practices uh, per se to uh, to share. We'll be doing a project next year, uh, a fellowship program to get more women uh, involved in our technical events. Um, but I see there are a lot of initiatives to get young women onto technology. My question is how do we transform uh, those male-dominated communities that already exist uh, and get more women involved in those spaces too? Thank, Thank you. you. So we're hearing quite a few things pop up quite a lot, no? In terms of one of the biggest issues that we're facing is shifting culture and stereotypes, which has a huge impact around thinking about access. Um, and this sort of culture and stereotype shifts from space to space and groups of women, but this is a major factor. Um, the other thing is around language and the availab availab availability of language that is not in English um, and also relevant content, um, for example, and that online <coughs> and offline gender-based violence is a huge factor to consider. Um, when coming, when thinking about access and gender issues. Before I sort of 
give the last word to each of the discussants. Um, I just want to say and remind again that this BPF work is ongoing. Um, we would really like to invite your participation and your engagement in this work. Please come and see either myself or Millie or Anri at the end of this session if you would like to participate and we can tell you exactly how. Um, the survey is still up and if you can use that to speak to your communities as well, that'll be fantastic. We really aim to get a first draft, second draft out of this report by March. So anything that you can do before that will be really, really helpful, as well as all of the initiatives that you've shared here that you want to be part of this, survey, the, this best practice forum work as well. We would welcome it um, hugely. So thank you very much. And now to the panelists, you can do it. <laughs> um, please, yeah, share a little bit about, yeah, I guess, you know, yeah, your last word. Okay. Well, <clears throat> to the question on age, I mean, I guess that as soon as possible, because uh, we still have some children going to school and having classes on uh, like how it is important to code. And in Brazil, I've seen some schools that are teaching um, p girls, little girls to code through Minecraft. So, I mean, it's a little video game. People can learn from that. And I guess like one key thing to do is not to differentiate like teach them from the very early beginning how they could be working on that and how this is not a man's thing, like it's not a boy's thing. Girl can be like developing games online, so it's super fun, it's super nice also. I wish I had gone this way. Um, on the, the like, sorry, I was just, oh yeah, on the cultural shift, like really quickly, um, I, I guess we can try to like do this cultural shift by being present like in every single part of possible and showing ourselves as and, ha and like speaking and taking the turns and this is pretty much what I had to say. Um, to come back to your question, um, it's, it's really challenging and it takes time and trust and I think that um, where I've noticed a big disconnect between um, te technology and refugee environments is that it's not working with traditional communication ecosystems. Um, so we don't go in and observe how does this community normally practice, how is this being fractured by displacement and how are they starting to pick up that, those communications again. And just like with any SGBV work, we cannot do it without engaging men and boys. And I think that um, a lot of focus on women's literacy classes, women's digital education classes, um, have been maybe at the exclusion of men, and we really, we really need them to be in the room. That's not the panacea, that's not the, the silver bullet, bullet to your solution, and, and we're going to get there tomorrow, but I think um, without that time and that, that general community trust and working with the intersect of traditional communications and how that community traditionally allows or not women to access information, um, we're not going to get there when we start introducing new and relatively frightening technologies if you consider about how empowering they, they potentially could be for women. So. Um, regarding uh, breaking down cultural barriers, I think um, uh, what we have done in our communities is if the women uh, work alongside men in building up the community network themselves, they have a, so a sort of responsibility. So men and women share the responsibility together, and uh, that's where they are actually, we see, I see in, our, in my community networks that actually there is, uh, there is not so much of dis uh, discrimination between men and women. Um, women are actually taking equal, are actually equally participating in the network. So they are actually, they are also earning for the network. So they are, it's a, it's a business model for them. So they are actually participating. And regarding the content, um, uh, we do have some of the content from the government of uh, India. The government of India has some of the local uh, regional language content, which is, which is translate, which is uh, put forth to the villagers over there. So that's something that is there already. Yeah. Uh, maybe to answer Carolina, and I didn't get your name. Uh, in, in, in Africa, there is a, a couple of initiatives that I know of. Uh, I don't know exactly the support that you are requiring, whether it is about gender-based violence, setting up networks, and 
your question was a bit broad in that sense, but aft cheeks and sent cheeks are places where there are uh, well, th there are organizations that are created to promote, are, are trying to promote the technical capacity of women, and uh, I would encourage you, and if you want, I can put you in contact with them, and maybe there are resources for you to attend their workshops, and we hopefully gonna gonna start working with them or trying to build capacity around community networks as well. So, well, this is. Um, thanks. I think I just want to talk about the content in particular in a different language. I think um, for me, my perception is that there has to be an understanding that we are also producers of the content and to actually make use of the platforms that we have to put content that's relevant to us. I do not so know some people set up like specific closed groups on like Facebook and then they use those forums to like have discussions and it's in their language that they understand. Now I know that it's a platform that someone else has created, but I think it's one way of starting to perceive like how do we, with the resources that we have, how do we make sure that we're putting out content that's in our language that we understand and that's relevant to us. So shifting that um, understanding of having to wait for the content to be put online, but rather us putting the content that's relevant for us online. Thank you. <laughs> okay, um, on culture shift, right? Um, this is in specific to um, one of our visit to um, one of the village indigenous communities. Um, so there is gender disparity. It's um, it's obvious. Um, so perhaps then the solution is not to bring in um, the the ideas of community network at this point, um, because there's no point if women are not going to run the things or to be part of the process of building it. Um, so it's, um, I don't know, it's a long process, um, and I hope, yeah, this would continue. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, and thank you so much for your participation today, and please, yeah, get involved with us if you want to be part of that. Challenge today by everyone. I really love it. Like, yeah.